Hi, I'm Richard Moraes, Senior Minister at Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center, and I want to thank you for visiting our website and for tuning in to today's message. If you feel inspired by today's talk, I really encourage you to make a donation by hitting that button below and making a contribution to this ministry. It'll allow us to continue these messages online and to do the great work we do here at Unity of Phoenix, which is to inspire people to live better lives. So thanks for tuning in, thanks for your support, and we hope to see you at a Sunday real soon. Morning again, everyone. And a shout out to everybody who tunes in and watches us online. So this woman's walking along the beach and she finds a lamp and she rubs it and a genie pops out and she's actually shocked and amazed. And then she says to the genie, hey, do I get three wishes? And the genie says, no, unfortunately, we don't do that anymore. That you only get one. So you really need to think of something good and something you really want. Lady thinks and says, you know, something I've always wanted and wished for is I want peace in the Middle East. And see this map? I want you to see this map. Every country on this map, I want you to make them stop fighting and develop love and compassion and kindness and mutual support for each other and that they will live in harmony for all time. And the genie says, God, Zooks, lady. These countries have been at war for thousands of years. Their division is so deeply rooted, and I haven't made a wish in a thousand years, granted one, and I don't think I got the power to do that. So I think you're going to need to think of another wish. Lady thinks for a second and said, well, the only other thing I can think of is that I've never been able to meet the right man. You know, one that is kind and thoughtful and caring, one who listens and helps cook and clean, one who's passionate and loves my family and loves all my friends, who doesn't watch sports all the time, and is completely devoted and fully faithful. That's really what I wish for, that kind of man. And the genie looks at her for a second and says, can I see that map again, please? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> all right. So how many people have ever wanted it to be that easy that you could just wish and get everything you want. Anybody ever have one? You know, I think we all have that desire to find some way to turn the things that aren't working into something's great and to have all of our dreams come true. And the fact is, we already have that kind of power within us. The only thing is we just don't believe it and we don't sometimes realize it. And that great power that we have within us to make our dreams come true and to attract great things into our life is in our minds. I mean, when you think about it, the mind is the greatest creative, powerful tool and gift that we have been given because our thoughts and our thinking literally directs our creative energy. Our thinking attracts and manifests, it shapes and transforms our current conditions and situations into something even greater and something even better. Our minds are more powerful than we realize. Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor in 170 AD said this, the most important things in life are the thoughts we choose to think. The most important things in life are the thoughts we choose to th think. And the reason he said that is because he knows that our thinking and what we choose to think literally has an impact on every area of our lives, on our attitude, on our health, on our inner peace or levels of stress, on our levels of happiness or success or the experience of frustration and turmoil and despair, that literally the quality of our thoughts impacts the quality of our lives. So a question we all need to ask ourselves sometimes is, what thoughts am I choosing to think? What thoughts am I choosing to think about myself or the people in my life or my conditions and situations? Are they positive, optimistic, and uplifting, or are they negative, sometimes dwelling on our mistakes, dwelling on things that aren't working? Or are they affirming, and are they appreciative, and are they thoughts of always seeing possibilities and even greater things? In his book, um, As a Man Thinketh, James Allen in 1903 said, our life is what our thoughts make of it. A man will find that as he alters his thoughts towards things and other people, things and other people will alter themselves towards him. So today we're going to talk about the power of the mind, and how we develop greater mental fitness. So in week two of our annual Game On 30-Day Fitness Challenge, and this ministry is really to hear to help inspire people to live better lives, to teach powerful spiritual lessons and principles that will expand our lives to live more fully, more lovingly, and more freely. And what we need to build a better life is really to have a strong foundation, 
And the four pillars of a strong foundation to build a better life is physical fitness, mental fitness, emotional fitness, and spiritual fitness. And you know, when one of those uh, pillars is not strong, if we're not, you know, physically fit or mentally fit, it, we cannot build a strong and greater life. So it's important for us to work on these areas. And all the Game On Challenge is asking is 60 minutes a day. 20 minutes on physical, 20 minutes on mental and meditation, 10 minutes feeding your mind positive stuff or doing affirmations, and 10 minutes of emotional fitness, which is journaling or releasing uh, negative energy. Would you be willing to make that commitment of 60 minutes a day to build a stronger foundation, to build a, a better life? You know, what I find is that when you become more disciplined in one area, it kind of spills over and builds some momentum in other areas. So just getting your game on in any of these areas will begin to create a, a wonderful level of momentum. Last week we looked at physical fitness. Today we're going to go a little deeper with mental fitness. So how many people here um, believe your mind is as powerful in attracting and creating things we want? We all do. And the question is, then why aren't our lives as great and successful and prosperous and amazing as we'd want? If we indeed believe that, why aren't we using our minds in that way to create that? And so there's some things we, we do and experience in our lives that kind of make it hard for us to utilize our minds in a more powerful way. And the first one is that every one of us has experienced some conditioning of things in our lives that aren't healthy, that aren't true, um, and that are very limiting for us. Sometimes we've grown up believing things like we aren't lovable, you know, that we aren't worthy, you know, that things will never work out uh, for us. Sometimes we are you know, caught in shame, thoughts of shame and limitation uh, and regret. And we play these old tapes and they keep running over and over again, looking at ourselves in the mirror every day and thinking we're ugly, or we're fat, we're not lovable. You know, every day thinking things are never going to work out, I'll probably get uh, hurt, you know, that I'm a victim or I'm powerless. We think these negative, harmful things, maybe that's just not possible. It'll probably never happen for me. You know, we think all of these types of things, and so that conditioning sometimes is hard for us to break through uh, to think uh, greater and more positive thoughts. Another thing that uh, limits us is that we sometimes can lack mental discipline. Sometimes we can be mentally lazy. Anybody ever been lazy to go to the gym? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> Well, sometimes we know to do affirmations. We know to think positively. You know, we know to hold our intentions. We know to write our goals. But sometimes we mentally don't do the things to guard our mental house and to feed our minds the most positive things. You know, sometimes we'll come up with excuses and blame people rather than sit down and write the things we want to achieve and feeding our minds these positive things. Um, sometimes we'll just stay in our comfort zone and just settle by mentally just kind of being kind of lazy and not doing the things we know we need to do. And the last one is a lack of clarity. You know, sometimes we could complain about what we don't want and what we don't like all day long. And then you turn to somebody and say, but what do you want? Mm, I don't know. Sometimes we aren't sure about what we want. I'm the worst guy to take to a buffet. I'm so, there's too many choices. What should I have? I don't know. Should I have some of this, that? Anybody ever been a little wishy-washy or uncertain about what to do? I mean, sometimes just the act of not knowing and putting ambiguous, uncertain energy out there pro stops us from using the power of our minds to create and attract what we desire. We'll talk a little about that one more uh, in a little bit. Franklin Roosevelt once said this, men and women are not prisoners of fate, but only prisoners of their own minds. It is our minds that limit us. It is our minds that hold us back. It is our minds that have us thinking that this isn't possible, or I don't deserve this, or I, I don't look beautiful, or I don't look this or that, the other thing, our own minds. But here's the good news. Paul, the Apostle Paul said this, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul in this statement is recognizing we all have those conditionings, we have all those patterns and limitations, but even if we do, that we can still transform our minds. We can still transform and renew our minds and transform our lives. So, in the same way we worked on physical fitness, we're going to talk today about mental fitness. Now, I want you to kind of guess, what do you think, if I were to say to you, what would be the first step you'd take in mental fitness? What would you guess? Anybody? Did you attend the first service, man? I'm impressed. You ought to get a prize. So, here we go. Uh, and we'll get to it in one second. So here's what it says in Philippians 2, verse 5. It says, let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you. Let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. So that means a loving mind, a grateful mind, a faith-filled mind, 
a forgiving mind, a compassionate mind, an understanding mind. Paramahansa Yogananda said the goal of life is to be at one with the mind of God, to create a God consciousness, a Christ consciousness, that the whole purpose of our existence is to allow our minds to be one with the mind of God. And the most important thing in getting our minds one with the mind of God is exactly what that gentleman said, and that is to begin to quiet the mind. Because our minds tend to be busy. Our minds tend to engage in a lot of mental chatter. How many people ever found your mind racing and you couldn't stop it or turn it off? Anybody ever have that? You know? How many people ever overthink something? Anybody overthink? You know, we think a lot, we think a lot. You know, studies show that women spend more time thinking about what men are thinking than men actually spend time thinking. <laughs> So, uh, it's a lot of thinking. <laughs> so, we all engage in overthinking, mind chatter, it goes on and on. And it isn't easy to quiet that down, but it's important. It is absolutely important. And I'm sure we've had the experience, we're all meditating and then we're thinking, oh man, you know, I forgot to do this or I forgot to do that or my back is itchy. It's tough to quiet your mind. But it's an important thing. And the important thing is don't get mad at yourself because that's just a part of having a human brain and a human mind is it wanders. But we always need to keep bringing it back gently, consistently. And the universal way from, of meditation to bring it back is through the breath. The word breath comes from the word spiritus. And it is a connection not to our spirit. And the breath really connects us to the present moment. Because the mind tends to go to the past, it goes to the future. And breath brings it back. And just slowing down our breathing and following our breath, slowing down our breathing, following our breath, really begins to quiet the mind. Some people call it emptying the mind, but it creates some space. And what that space does, it actually calms us, it relaxes us, it brings a sense of peace. And when we feel peace, guess what? It opens us up. And things that aren't for our best begin to fall away. We're able to let go and release of things we're holding on to and we become more present. We become more aware. Things actually get clearer for us the quieter we get. When we quiet the mind, it actually helps us tune in to a deeper and higher level. When we quiet the mind, it actually helps us hear and listen to the still small voice. When we quiet the mind, we can connect and notice our intuition, our inner guidance. When we quiet the mind, it opens us and aligns us, and we feel at one with God. See, the most effective way to use your mind is first to quiet it. You know Einstein, when he would want to do a little creative session and do some problem solving, first thing he did, took a nap, because he recognized a refreshed, quiet mind was a mind that could be far more creative and far more effective. So the only way, in my opinion, to immerse your mind in the mind of God is to relax and quiet your mind so you can feel that greater connection and tap into that inner wisdom of the mind of God. And we always think it's got to be some grandiose big thing. I guarantee you, just doing one minute, whatever number of times a day of just closing your eyes, taking a deep breath, and just seeing quietly saying to yourself, I rest my mind in the mind of God. So everyone, just take a deep breath. Just softly to yourself, say, I rest my mind in the mind of God. Together, I rest my mind in the mind of God. Take another deep breath. I rest my mind in the mind of God. Another deep breath. A longer gap. I'll say it again one more time. I rest my mind in the mind of God. Another deep breath. Just doing that for a minute and allowing that phrase, I rest my mind in the mind of God, to have more gap and space between it, I guarantee you, will begin to quiet and open and relax your mind to greater things. The second thing that we need to do is to condition the mind. You know, when Jesus said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened unto you, you know, it was a real message to be clear about what you want to ask for. Be clear about what you're seeking. Be clear about what you want to knock and be opened unto you. 
And again, often we don't know what we actually want. So the message in the ask, seek, and knock is really get clear about what you want. Get clear about what you are want to call forth and manifest. Get clear about it. And, you know, getting clear is an important thing. Clarity is one of the most efficient things. Somebody once said, the world clears a path to those who know where they're going. When you're clear, it's more like laser focus of your energy rather than dissipating it. But it's conditioning your mind is more than just being clear, clear, although it begins with clarity. Michael Beckwith put it this way. He said, you can have anything you want, but first you must become it in consciousness. So clarity is the beginning, but then you must become it in consciousness. Let me give you the best scripture that I can think of that describes that. Jesus said this, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Whatever you ask in prayer, the clarity, believe you've received it, which is to embody it. Believe it, own it, feel it, accept it, realize that it is yours, celebrate it, think about it, talk about it, become it. That whatever you want, become it in consciousness. We, the clarity is good, but it is not enough. There's more to it than that. It is to ask yourself, think of something you want in your life right now. You're clear about it, but can you believe that you've received it? Can you accept it? Can you own it? Can you believe it? Can you feel it? What would be different about you if you had that right now? Would you look differently? Would you talk differently? Would you hang out with different people? What would it take for you to become that thing that you are clear that it is that you want? So let's say, I'm going to give some silly examples. Like let's say you want a new car. You know, for clear you want a car, but you've got to become it in consciousness. And so maybe if you've got a two-car garage and you've got it all stacked up, maybe it's to clear a place for your new car. Maybe it's to figure out how much is that monthly payment going to be? Where am I going to wash my new car? You know, think about the things uh, about you having, making a space for that new thing. Maybe it's a new relationship. Maybe you've been working so hard, you don't have room for it, but you say you want one. Well, create spaces before it comes. Think about how you want to show up in that relationship and how fun it would be to have it. The feelings that you'd have, the things you'd do, the things you'd talk about. Create that space. Suppose you want to earn 50% more income. What would that feel like? How much more prosperous would you feel? What would you actually do with it? It's one thing to be clear that you want it, and that's beautiful. But you have to own it, embody it, believe that you've received it, because you can have anything you want, but first you must become it in consciousness. You've got to condition your consciousness. One of my favorite lines in Psalm 19 says this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. And what it's saying is let your words reflect the kind of life that God wants for you, the kind of person you want to be and the kind of life you're meant to live. Because you can't say, hey, I'm clear I want prosperity, but your words say, hey, I'm always broke and I never seem to have enough. You, know, you can't say, hey, I want this loving relationship and it's, you know, you can't trust men or I always pick bad women or whatever thing we say. But let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts reflect and condition us into the kind of life that we want, the kind of experiences that we want to create. So conditioning our consciousness is about getting clear, but it's about going further, about embodying it, believing it, feeling it, rejoicing in it, and acting as if it were real right now. Another important thing that we need to do to utilize the mind is use the power of our imagination. The imagination is absolutely unlimited. People have thought and created amazing things out of just holding that image and that picture in their minds. Everybody knows that famous one of Jim Carrey. Um, he was broke, and he parked in front of an old theater, and he imagined his name up on that marquee. And then he wrote himself a check for $10 million. And then he got a, a couple years later, signed a deal for a movie called Dumb and Dumber. Guess how much they paid him? $10 million. Charlie Chaplin was an orphan, poor, broke, out on the streets, and even as a kid, he imagined he'd be one of the most famous people in the world. He imagined it as a kid, an orphaned kid, and he absolutely did it. George Washington Carver looked at a peanut and with his imagination came up with 300 uses for a peanut. Leonardo da Vinci is considered the greatest genius of all time. 
not just a great artist for the Last Supper and uh, the Mona Lisa, but he was also an inventor and a scientist. And he, they found 13,000 pages of his designs and his drawings. He was born in 1452. He was the person who came up with the first prototype for a bicycle, for a helicopter, for uh, certain musical instruments, for bridges, for various forms of pumps, for hand gliders, because he had an imagination. They said the greatest asset he had about his mind is he was curious about everything. He was curious about everything. He would imagine all kinds of things, and that's why he is, was considered a genius. Last year, on the, at this talk, I gave this quote by George Bernard Shaw, one of my favorites. Some people see life as it is and ask why, and some others see life as it could be and ask why not. So why not be happier than you've ever been? Why not become gr in, in, in the best shape of your life? You know, why not experience greater happiness? Why not, you know, make a great difference? Why not be more generous? You know, why not do things that you've never done before? Last year when I was given this list, I said, why not have the Toronto Raptors win the NBA championship? I mean, I mean, I know it's silly, but apparently tomorrow night it might happen, and why not? And so my question for you is, what can you imagine for your life? What's something, what could be possible for you? You know, what is it that you would look at your life and say, why not? Why not something bigger and better than I've ever experienced? Why not? Because that's the power of our imagination. We have that gift in our mind to be able to do that. The last thing I want to talk about is to develop the mind of a learner. Because the fact is, nobody ever gets it right the first time. Bill Gates said, Success is a lousy teacher because he says, when we have success, sometimes we don't try as hard. We stop thinking, we stop pushing ourselves. But he said, when things don't go well, we fo it forces us to think creatively, do, you know, step outside the box and do things in a, a way we hadn't done before. There was an engineer and his name was um, Soricho and he applied for a job at Toyota and he got turned down he had a really hard time getting a job, and so he turned to making scooters in his own garage. And during that time, he started imagining possibilities for his life, possibilities for his career. And uh, Soricho Honda, while he was unemployed, imagined his own car company, and I think he did pretty well. Sean Corey Carter couldn't get anybody to sign a record deal for him. He had to sell his CDs out of his own trunk. And last week, he became the first billionaire rapper. Of course, we know him as Jay-Z. And I promise this is my last Toronto Raptors example. <laughs> but Pascal Siakam didn't start playing basketball until he was 17 years old. He was from Cameroon. And he kept saying to himself, I'm going to keep getting better and I'm going to keep improving. This year, he will win the NBA's most improved player. But here's the reason I say it. In his first NBA game, a playoff game, he scored 32 points, which put him up with Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. And I guarantee you, if you were to say some 17-year-old kid who had never played basketball before but was enthusiastic and thought he could get better would be scoring 32 points in his first NBA game, I don't think anybody would believe that. But you know what? He did. And he knew he wasn't that good, and he knew he, kept, he had to keep learning and keep getting better. And my question is, what in your life are you willing to improve, and what do you want to get better? And are you willing to be committed to being a learner, to keep improving, to keep having progress? You know, one of the things that ticked Michael Jordan off the most is when people said, oh, you're just a natural. He hated that because he felt it diminished the hard work that he put in to become the great player that he is. And the fact is, all of us, it takes work. It says this in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. Many times it says Jesus was in a temple studying. Jesus went apart and prayed. Jesus didn't come in like that. He came in with the potential, and he expanded it to its fullest because he did the work. He had the mind of a learner. Studies show that the average American reads one book a year. 
Studies also say 90% of the stuff we think today, we thought yesterday. We tend to think the same thing over and over again. No wonder we get the same results. But learners, the most successful people, read a book a week. And the reason they're successful, why? Because new ideas. They're always willing to learn, always willing to see new angles, to discover new things, and that's what brings an expansion in their progress. Anthony Bourdain, the late great, said this, I am an advocate for, if I'm an advocate for anything, it is to move as far away as you can, across the ocean or simply across the sea, walk in someone else's shoes or at least eat their food. That's a plus for all of us. And what he's saying is, try something new. Learn about someone, learn about their food, learn about their culture, try, you know, take, study a different language, you know, t take a pottery class, take an archery class, take a singing lesson, do anything. Try something different because it'll expand your mind in an amazing and wonderful way. You'll discover new things that you hadn't before. Napoleon Hill, we've all heard this one before. Whatever your mind can conceive and believe it will achieve. Everybody's heard that. Here's the, uh, it, there's actually the second half of the same sentence says this, whatever your mind can conceive and believe it can achieve, regardless of how many times you've failed in the past. That's the second half. I think that's even more impressive than the first part of the sentence, or at least as, that it's never too late. That regardless of the mistakes, regardless of how far you think you are, you can learn, you can progress, and you can improve if you stick to it, and it's something that you really want. Whether you're unemployed, whether you only started learning, playing basketball late, it doesn't matter. Is if you have the mindset of a learner, if you have the mindset of growth and progress and improvement and willing to commit it, great things will happen. Here's a line from Churchill. He says, success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. And I love that line because we will fail. Things will not work. But if you are enthusiastic and believe you can improve and get, be and get better, great things will happen. Remember that uh, commercial or that program they had or whatever it was? It says, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. The fact is we all have amazing minds and we're underutilizing it. And so the question, this amazing tool, there's a genius within us or we could even say there's a genie within us and it's our own minds. The question is, are you going to use it to quiet your mind, to condition your mind, to let your mind imagine? and to develop a learner's mind. Because when you do, you'll develop a very strong foundation. And if you are committed to change your life and develop mental fitness, all I want to say to you is, game on. God bless you, everybody.